stuff. So uh, once again, this is the Wi-Fi password and also the, the Wi-Fi network and also the password. Um, so we only have we can only connect up to 80 devices. So if your phone is on the Wi-Fi, please switch it off so that someone else could get connected. So if you need power, the silver boxes on the floor, that's actually the electric plug. You should have enough. If you don't have enough, we also have the extension right up here in, the, in front. So if you need it, just raise your hand and we will get to you. Um, yeah, the bathroom, it's at the door there. So you need to get through the door and find the red door that will lead you to the bathroom. Um, okay. So now we're ready to start. So you are here because of a Tech Ladies Bootcamp. If you don't know what it is, I'm going to tell you. So the Tech Ladies Bootcamp is a 10-week part-time program where we teach you how to code uh, for, for NGOs. So you will work in groups of three to create a product for an, a non-profit organization. And the rest you can read. Huh? For the second bootcamp, we are only going to be teaching you the Ruby programming language, which is kind of the language that we have been using since the first workshop. There will be five coaches, uh, helping five NGOs. So we will be selecting 15, 15 participants for this batch. So we will start the program on 24th of September and we'll run it, we'll meet every Saturday. Uh, around this time, like one to five, every Saturday but you're expected to code on your own during the, the week. Uh, so it costs $500 to participate. Scholarships are available. If you need a scholarship, it's also on the application form. Okay. So for more details on the, the bootcamp, go to this website. So you might wanna, it's actually kinda like everywhere already, but if you need, just take a photo of this slide. Okay, I think we all have that. So one thing is very, very important, the application closes on 2nd September, that gives, gives us about a couple of weeks. So to apply, you will need to complete a technical task, and this is the technical task. So create an app, push it onto GitHub, deploy it on Heroku. So this, uh, if you keep hearing us say, oh, do you have a GitHub Heroku, that's, that's because like, we, we want you to get ready for the task. So some idea, so we don't care what app you want to do. So I know some of the participants they want to do like a puzzle app. Um, just feel free to run free, you know, like run, go crazy. Some ideas for you is a travel wish list app. Uh, you can just create an article of the countries you want to go, when do you want to go, and maybe why do you want to go. The stretch goals are completely optional. It's up to you if you want to try and learn how to do that too. The second idea is a blog, a personal blog. So it's the, you have a blog post, a blog, and there's a page where you can see all the blog posts. Or you can do an event listing app. So it's kind of like Eventbrite where you sign up for this workshop for. And the fourth idea that we have for you is to like a like a magic eight ball. You just insert any random text and it give you more random text back. So so like. I know that all of you are beginners and if you need any help, sometimes it's easier, it's really a lot easier if you also post a screenshot because um, some pro it's, a, it's just a lot easier to explain your problem where we can see what kind of error messages you are receiving. So take a screenshot of where, wherever you're stuck and post the question on a Facebook group. So do it at the group, don't do it at the page because I meant the page and I'm not that technical. So sometimes I'm like, uh, can I help you? So if you need if you need some sort of advice on how you can structure whatever application you want to build, also do it at the, at the group. Or you can just ask, grab one of the coaches today during the break or after the workshop. So some tips that I thought might be useful for you when you're trying to learn how to code. So before you recognize that it is a problem, like run through these sanity checks. Like, did you save your file? Because sometimes on Nitrous, if you don't save your file, it will, be, it will appear as a little circle and your codes wouldn't run because you haven't saved it yet. So check if you have saved your file. The second thing is check if you're in the right folder. Sometimes if you do a git status, it wouldn't show you stuff or you like try and do any funky git stuff or try and start your server. But if you're in the wrong folder, then you're in the wrong universe and it wouldn't work. So make sure that you're in the right folder. Uh, the, the third one, is, I think it's more relevant if you're only using Nitrous. 
because sometimes nitrous just like they just switch off your server for whatever reason so you have to make so if you want to refresh your page you realize you will see this like gray depressingly gray page telling you your server isn't isn't like switched on so you might want to start your server again in some cases when you are where you are, when you are creating or updating your database which we'll talk more about it later, like what, what is this database thing, you might need to restart your server, or like some strange reason, I don't really know, you, there are some situations where you need to restart your server, so just try restarting it to see if things work. Okay? So, um, again, these are the important dates for the bootcamp. Okay, okay? And that's all. So, so um, if, the, if this is the first time you're at this workshop, how we work is there will be a head coach, Ted over here, will lead the entire session. If, if you have any questions or like stuff don't work as expected, just raise your hand. We have a lot of assistant coaches today who could help you out. So what we're gonna do now is we will have the assistant coaches stand up. Okay, uh, sharing your assistant coach, yes. Okay, then we'll go like one round where they will just yell out their name and we'll say hi, name, okay? We'll start from uh, Wei Liang. Hi, I'm Wei Liang. Hi, Wei Liang. Ladies, you need to say hi to your assistant coach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi, hi. 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 Hi, Beside Kyung, I cannot see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, Sherwin. Hi, Dragosh. Hi, Dragosh. Hi, Michael. Okay, great. So let's start the workshop proper. Um, you want to flash the slides and tell them the link to the slides? Yeah, it's in there. Okay, there you go. Okay, I lost my mouse. No, it's right there. This is the third installment and the final installment of the three-part Tech Ladies workshop. So for the benefit of the assistant coaches, let's do a, a show of hands. If this is the first workshop, the first Tech Ladies workshop that you attend, please raise your hand. All right. If this is the second Tech Ladies workshop, please raise your hand now. All right. And if you've been to all three workshops, Please raise your hand. 
All right. Great. So there are a lot of people who actually attended all the workshops. So in this final workshop, this, this workshop will hopefully help you prep a lot for the technical task that is the entry requirement for the boot camp. And I'll be doing a lot of slides. And one of the feedbacks from the previous workshops was that if you encounter some problem, you sort of fall behind and you miss out on some of the slides. So for this workshop, the slides are available at this URL. So I recommend you all to open up this in a separate tab. So I think it's inevitable to bump into some problems, but if you do, you don't have to be afraid that you will miss out on the slides because they're all available here. So I'll give you all a minute or two to open this up. So hopefully by now everyone has set up either a Nitrous account and started a Ruby on Rails uh, project. Uh, and the slides are assuming that you're using Nitrous. So if you want to use a local installation of Ruby and Rails, uh, some of the commands will be slightly different. But if you have any problems, you can just raise your hand and your, your friendly coaches will come and help you out. If you have neither a Nitrous account or a local installation right now, then this is definitely the time to raise your hand to, to get some help. So in this third and final workshop, we'll be learning about Rails. And we'll continue building the Guess a Number game that uh, we've been using as the example in the previous workshops. So Rails is a framework for building web applications, and it's written entirely in Ruby. Uh, you can actually go and see all the source code for Rails uh, hosted on GitHub. And what the framework does, it basically gives you a bunch of high-level building blocks that help you build a certain kind of application, and in our case, a web application, because we want to host the application on the internet. So Rails is built on what is called the MVC pattern. And you can think of the MVC pattern as what is called as a layered architecture. And much like a, a cake that has different layers, uh, Ruby on Rails also has three different layers where each layer has a particular responsibility. And the layers in the case of Rails are the models, the views, and the controllers, so MVC. In MVC, our models are used to describe objects in our business domain and also to model their relationships. And in Rails, they can also be responsible for some other things like saving our data to a database or validating that the data is correct. The view layer, on the other hand, is responsible for presenting the data to the end user. And in the case of Rails, uh, this is done through web pages. So for those of you who were at the previous workshop, you will be familiar with the HTML and ERB templates. Uh, so it's mostly plain HTML, but it also allows you to use some Ruby code in there. Finally, in Rails, there's the controller and the controller acts like sort of a thin layer of glue that will connect your view layer or the user interface uh, with the models that are uh, capturing the data of your application. So in the previous workshop, it was previously, previously covered how requests and responses are sent over the internet to a web application. And from the perspective of the hardware, uh, you have a client that is, can be a laptop or it can be a phone or a desktop computer where a user is browsing the internet. And it will send a request to a server which will send a response back to the client. 
And the jargon we use for this is usually front end and back end. So you'll probably hear these terms thrown around a lot if you talk to, to developers. Uh, and it's roughly the same as talking about the client and the server. If you start looking at the software that is actually sending and uh, sending the requests, on the front end you will normally have something like a web browser that is responsible for sending the request to the server and rendering the HTML tem templates that it gets back as a response. And of course on the server the software we're running is Ruby on Rails. So we talked a little bit about the architectural layers, the models, views, and controllers. Uh, but of course, these don't really correspond to any of our business domain objects. So Rails is also based around something called resources and something called RESTful routing. So if we take the cake from before, where the horizontal layers correspond to the models, the views, and the controllers, we can think of a resource like a slice out of the cake. So each resource will have its own model, it will have its own controller, and it will have its own set of views. And on these resources, we can perform a set number of actions. And these actions are normally remembered through the mnemonic uh, CRUD. And CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. So these four basic actions are normally available on resources. It's worth to note that in Rails there are also other controller actions in addition to these. And these are used to render the forms that are needed to create and update our resources. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the difference between CRUD and controller actions are later. So I hope now that everyone has Nitrous up and running with a Rails template. Uh, if not, you can call on one of the coaches to help you out. So the first thing we're gonna do is to create our first resource. But before we do that, uh, or anything else for that matter, there's another important thing that we should do first. So, if you were at the previous workshop, you're probably somewhat familiar with uh, Git. So at certain points throughout this workshop, we're actually going to commit our work so that in the case that we do something horribly wrong, then we can easily revert back to a working version of our code. So the first thing you need to do is to uh, go into your terminal, change the working directory to the directory of your application, and if you're using Nitrous, it's in the directory code slash example. For the benefits of the other coaches on the floor, this is a very common source of, of problems. You need to make sure that you're in the right directory when you run the terminal commands, because a lot of times you're in some other directory and the, the commands won't work. So it's a good sanity check to see that you're always in the right directory. So once you've changed to the right directory, you will use git init set up a new git repository. Following git init, you need to do git add dash a. And what the dash a does is it adds everything, including things that were deleted and empty folders and such. And finally, you need to commit your work. So for commit, when you pass it the dash m flag, it allows you to uh, input a commit message inside quotation marks. And it's common to call the first commit of a project initial commit. And if 
you're using Nitrous, after you do git init, uh, you hopefully see your uh, terminal prompt change. And in addition to the directory you're in, it will also tell you which git branch you're using. commit your work into Git now, so we're going to move on to the next slide. So let's go back to adding our first resource to our Rails application. So we're building a guess the number game, and the first resource we want is probably a game resource so that we, we have something in our application that actually represents one single uh, playthrough of the game. So Rails comes with a bunch of built-in generators um, and what these generators do is they basically write a lot of code for you uh, and with doing that it also makes a lot of assumptions about the code that it writes. Uh, but we're going to use this to generate uh, the first game resource. So in Rails your resources will have attributes and in this case we will give our game resource two attributes. The first one is the number, or the secret number, that is, will be the correct guess for this uh, particular instance of the game. The second attribute will be a completed attribute that will tell you whether the game has finished playing or not. So if you're familiar with the, the types from the first workshop, you can see that the number will be an integer or a whole number and the completed attribute will be true or false, or a boolean value. Also take note that all this should go on the same line, it just couldn't fit on one line in the slides. huge list of files that were automatically generated by our Rails generator. So Rails actually comes with a bunch of different generators and in this case we're using the scaffold generator which will give us the, the most complete set of files needed for our resource. <coughs> so 
I'm going to move to the next slide, but uh, if you're not done with this yet, uh, you always have the slides available at the URL showed initially. So before we can test the code that was generated out, we need to migrate our database. So what do I mean by that? Well, in Rails, when you change the database, it is done through Ruby code files that are code migrations. Uh, and this allows us to easily see the history of what changes have been done to the database and also to roll back changes that uh, we didn't actually want. So in order to actually run your migrations, which will create the new table for the games in our database, you need to run the command rake db migrate in your terminal. So, I just, so some of them are still having internet problems, so I called the value person to see if there's anything we can do. We'll give them updates. In the meantime, they can try tethering from their phone or ask someone beside them to share their laptop with them. So what I'm going to need you is to tell all of this to the participants and also for people who are having problems with their internet, raise their hand so that we can, we can go and help them to like pair up with someone else. Okay? Right. Right, so it seems some, some of you still have uh, issues connecting to the Wi-Fi. If you have those issues, please raise your hand. All right, so we've, we've contacted the, uh, the owners of the venue to help us out with this, but in the meanwhile, hopefully we can come to some other solution where we can use tethering from a phone or pair you up with someone else. But uh, please keep your hand up so someone can come over and help you. which is called the Rails console. And it's very similar to the interactive Ruby environment that you tried out in the first workshop. Uh, the difference is that it also has all your Rails stuff loaded in there, so you can use the terminal to play around with the resources that we just created. And the Rails console is something that is used quite extensively by developers to, to test out their code. So you can get into the Rails console by typing Rails console in the terminal. And make sure that you're in the right directory when you type this or it won't work at all. And once you load the console up, try to type game.all and see what happens. And this game.all is just regular Ruby code. There's nothing magical going on in there. And if everything went well with generating our resource and migrating our database, uh, it will load up all our games from our database, but at the moment we don't have any games in there, so it will just be an empty list. But if any of this doesn't work, then please raise your hand so a coach can come over and help you.
So when you're done with your console write, in order to exit the console, you can either do control D or you can type exit into the console and press enter. are defined in a single file, file that is located in the config directory. So you can go ahead and open up this file now to see what's inside. And when I say open up this file, this is not a command to type in the terminal, you should just open this file in your IDE. So inside, inside your routes file, at the bottom there will be a whole bunch of comments that were generated by Rails to add some documentation on how to use the routes. If you want to, you can keep these comments, but uh, I tend to, to remove them to see the actual routes. So at the top, Rails generated a single line for us that says resources games. And what this will do is, it will actually provide us with the, the four CRUD actions that we talked about earlier, create, read, update, and delete. And the convention in Rails is to name your resources in plural, so it's actually games and not game. So we're going to do a small change to our routes file before we close it up again. And this change will make the uh, index page for games the, the default page of our web application. So when you go to the, the empty URL, uh, it will show us the list of our games. And you do this using the root command. So at the top you can write root2 and then the controller and the action you want to use as the default route. And in this case, it's games and index. And after you do this, don't forget to save your file, especially if you're in Nitrous. Thank you. 
see in the list that routes have been generated for us for the game's resource uh, for all the basic CRUD actions. So in the middle where it says URI pattern you can see the actual URL that uh, our users will enter into the browser to, to play around with our application. And on the right side you will see controller action and a controller in Rails is just a Ruby class and an action is just a method. And the index, index action will by default display a list of all our games. The show action will display an individual game. New and create actions gives us a, a form and a controller action to create new games. Edit and update actions is the same thing but for updates and the destroy action will help us delete our games. And if you look at the top of this file, you can see the, the root path that we added ourselves to the routes file. And the root path right now should be pointing to the index page, which would be the list of all games in our application. So we reached a bit of a milestone in our application now that we've 
added a route, and thanks to the Rails scaffold generator, uh, we actually have something fairly usable uh, that we can try out uh, already in our browser. So to start your server in Nitrous, uh, you run the command Rails server dash b followed by 0.0.0.0 and to open up the application you go to the menu and under preview you choose 43000 HTTP This is the game's index page that was automatically generated for us by Rails. And it provides us with a link to create a new game. You can see here from the list that currently there are no games in our database because we haven't created any yet. But if you click the new game link, it actually shows us a form that allows us to create a new game. So we're going to pick a number that is the the answer, the answer to our game, and in this case I'm going to pick 42, and because of the completed attribute that we added, it lets us indicate whether it's completed or not, but of course we don't want it to be completed yet. So I'm just going to press create game here, which will take us to the game show page. So this is the the page for the individual instance of a game. So this is the first game in our application. Uh, and you can see here that the game was successfully created. There's a link to an edit page that allows you to, to change the settings of your game. And if we look back in the game's index page now, the game will show up in our list of games. You can see the number we chose for this game was 42, and it is not yet completed. And it also has links to the, the other actions. So in terms of CRUD, this would be uh, read, update, and delete. So we can actually also try to delete our game by clicking the destroy link. It will prompt us whether we actually want to, to destroy this game, so I'm going to pick OK. You can see the game was successfully destroyed and our listing of games is now empty again. So all these things were actually provided to you by the, the Rails scaffold generator. And this is one of the, the powerful things that you can leverage when you start out as a new Rails developer. To put a lot of functionality out there without having to write a lot of code yourself. But of course these generators make a lot of assumptions about the, the code that it's generating, so uh, it won't give you a very custom solution. In terms of our guest, the, the Nightmare game, obviously there is, it's not really a game yet. Uh, it's, it just allows us to start new games.
something working in your browser. To, to exit the Rails server again, uh, you press Control C in your terminal. Right, so we have some basic scaffolding in place that allows us to create new games. Uh, but we want, we need at least one more resources uh, in order to make it into a functional game. But before we add that resource, there is again something important that we need to do. If you verify that your code actually works and tried it out in your browser, uh, it is also a good time now to commit your work into version control. So that when, if we add the new resource and we accidentally mess something up, we can easily revert back to this working version of our code. raise your hand and keep it up until Elisha can come over to you and give you the backup Wi-Fi. So it's important to commit our work into version control, partly because it gives us a, a safe point where we can restore our code to a working condition so that we don't end up losing a lot of work because we broke something later down the line. But it, it also provides us with some, uh, uh, some history. So when you actually view the commit log, you can see the steps that the programmer took to, to reach the functionality that we have now. Raise your hand now and Lysha will come over and help you out. So 
So I'm gonna allow for a couple minutes for you all to catch up to this point. If you're already here and you're getting bored, then feel free to uh, work ahead in the slides. game resource, but we kind of need uh, another resource to actually complete the game. And the other resource that we need is a guest resource, because we need to be able to add guesses to the game. Uh, so we're going to generate the guest resource using the race generators, but we're going to do it slightly differently this time. We're not going to use the scaffold generator. This is partly because it gives us too much stuff that we won't need, and it can't generate nested resources. And it's also good to get familiar with the, the other generators that are available in Rails. So we're going to start by generating the model part of the guest resource. And we'll move on to the view and the controller later. So our guest resource, of course, also needs a number. You need to be able to guess a number. 
and it also needs uh, a reference to the game that we're guessing in. Because we can have start several games in our application, we need uh, to be able to have guesses for each of the games so the, the application doesn't get confused. So we're going to use the, the model generator. We're going to generate a guess resource. We're going to get a number attribute and a game attribute. So again, this all goes on a single line in your terminal. being created by Rails. It will uh, create a migration file for the database, it will create a model file, and it will also create some test files. into the model file that was generated for us by Rails. So just to clarify, this, this is not a command that you should run, this is a file that you should open in your IDE. And if all went well, you should have this file in the app uh, slash models directory. If you manage to open this file, the content is going to look something like this. So thanks, for, thanks to the fact that we told the generator to give us an attribute that references a game, the relationship has already been set up from the, the side of the guest, and it is said to belong to a game. Now, if we open up our game model file that was already there from generating our first resource, its content is going to be empty. But in order for the relationship to work, uh, we also need to, to specify the relationship from the perspective of the game. And in the case of our game, uh, we want to be able to guess several times in a single game. So we will tell the, the game model that it has many guesses. Um, 
So the reason that Rails wasn't able to put this in automatically for us is that there is another option that the game could have only one guess. In that case, you would use has one guess. Uh, but of course, Rails can't really know our intention, so we need to put this manually into our model file. Once you've added this into your model file, make sure that you save the file before you do anything else. And again, we've generated a new resource, but there's no database table for it yet. Uh, we need to run the migration that was generated for us by Rails. So again, we do that by running the command rake db migrate. guess in our application. Uh, it allows us to store it in the database and we also express the relationship between a guess and a game in that uh, a guess belongs to a game and a game has many guesses. But in order for us to actually do something with this in our application uh, we need to add the other parts of the MVC. So we're gonna go ahead and generate a controller and we do this using the controller generator in Rails. And it's a common convention in Rails to name your controllers uh, in plural, so it's going to be guesses in this case. And the last uh, create there tells us that we only want to generate the create action because once we've added a guess, we don't really want to delete it or edit it afterwards. this generator, you can see that a different uh, set of files are generated by Rails. 
Uh, it generates a controller file, of course. It also inserts a route in our routes file. It creates some views for us, and it also creates some, some other stuff like uh, CSS files. So we need to check out the route that was added for us um, by the generator. So open up the routes file again. So again, this is a file that, that you need to open in your IDE. It's not a, a command. And you can see at the top, it actually inserted uh, get guesses slash create for us. But we don't really want to use that route, uh, partly because it's sort of on its own and we want it to be nested under our game so that we can express that through the URL which game the guess uh, should be added to. And we also want to, to keep working with this concept of resources. So we're going to change our routes file slightly. So we're going to nest the guesses resource under the games resource. We're also going to tell Rails that we only need the create action. Again, because in our game, we don't want to be able to change our guess afterwards, and we don't want to be able to delete it once we have made the guess. Faster or slower? <laughs> no, no. We're bringing 15 minutes time. Um, yeah, I think the, the brake is around there. Should be. something like this now. Uh, in order to verify that we got it right, we're going to run the, the rake routes command again. Uh, 
And hopefully, the output looks something like this. You can see now, under the root path at the top, there is a new route added for us. Uh, and it's nested under the, the games URL. And it is mapped to the guesses create controller action. So this is the route that will actually allow us to create new guesses for our game.
and that is simply pointing to the, the path that we created in our route file. In the form itself, it has a heading that says yes. Uh, it has a single input field uh, for the number of the yes, and it has a submit button. see all these brackets with uh, percentage signs inside them and these actually contain the Ruby code that will be rendered in our templates. wherever you want in your show file uh, but you don't, we don't need to replace the stuff that, it's, uh, that is already there because it allows us to, to see whether the game was completed and it also gives us some links uh, to go back so you put this form wherever you like in your show file wherever you want in the show file. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I'll do that.
sent off that file. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes. I said, said because uh, someone asked me. Yeah, yeah, should, exactly. should I say it again? Ah, okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> because people are still deleting. Uh, all right. So unless you want a page that has only a format in it, don't don't delete the other stuff that is already in there. The reason I didn't include it in this slide is that the code would have been awfully small if I put all of this. So just add this form in among the other content in the show file. Your last sentence. I, I have no more sentence for this <laughs> slide. Okay. All right. So I, I have orders from Elisha that we're supposed to take a break now. So use this break Give me them. Give me them to catch up. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> okay, ladies. We are. Oh, let me introduce you, my team. So if. Uh, if Sophia is seeing I don't know if you can see her, so she has been checking all of you in, so she's also helping out with the um, organizing of stuff. And today is a very special day because today is her birthday. <laughs> so we have a uh, cake coming out. So let's sing her a song. One, two, three. So now we have created our form for creating guesses for our game. And we have a means for users to input their guesses, but we're not yet doing anything with the guesses that the, that the user inputs. So if you remember, the controller is like the glue that connects the view that we just created with the model that we created using the generator earlier. So we're going to open up this file. Again, this, this is a file that you need to open. Uh, the guesses controller, which is located in your controller's directory. <laughs> and if you open this file right now, the only thing you should see is an empty create action. And the first thing we need to do is to allow the parameters that we need to be passed in. The reason you need to do this is because of a security feature in Rails called strong parameters. So 
basically anything passed by the user that we have not pre-approved uh, will not come through to the controller. So we're going to do this by creating a private method called guess params. And we're telling this method that in order for the params to go through to the controller, uh, it, it's required that the params has a guess key and we will only permit the number attribute from the form. The reason for this is that in creating web applications you should never trust user inputs because a user could easily manipulate what is sent to our application. So by doing this we're explicit about the things that we expect to come through. a common source of issues when you're just starting out with Rails. Uh, so it is recommended that you go and read up about strong parameters in your free time. But for now, just take note of how we are actually whitelisting the attributes that we want into our application. The next thing we need to do is we need to define the game that we're adding uh, a guest for. And we're going to do this using what's called a before action callback. And as the name implies, it is an action that is run before, uh, it's an, a method that is run before the action. We're going to call this uh, action set game. And we're going to use the game ID parameter that is passed from our view to find the game in our list of games. This is important because we need to know for which game the user is submitting a guess. If you've been to the previous workshops, you'll also notice that we're storing the game in an instance variable called at game. And this will make the variable available to all the other methods in our controller.
by doing this, we have accomplished two things now. We have explicitly stated our expectations about what the user will pass us. We're expecting them to pass us a guess that has only a number in it. We've also found a game for which the user is guessing and made the game available through the instance variable at game. Next I'm going to show you uh, what goes in the actual create action and the next slide won't have any of the other controller code but hopefully it's there already in your application. So finally we can tell uh, our create action to create a new guess inside our game. And thanks to the set game before action, uh, we now hopefully have a game available to us in the add game instance variable. So we tell this action that for this game's guesses, we want to create a new guess. And you can see the argument guess params. This is actually a call to the method that you define for the strong parameters. And by using the create method with a bang, this will actually generate an error if there were any problems with creating the guess. Finally, within the create action, we want to redirect back to the game show page. And we want to give the user an indication that their guess was accepted. So in this case, we'll just show them a message saying, good guess. Once you're done putting all this code inside your controller file, don't forget to save the file. And we're going to test this out. And hopefully we'll have uh, some functionality that allows us to add new guesses. Again, to run your server in Nitrous, 
use the command res server dash b followed by the four zeros and you go to the preview menu to open up your browser. And in the case that your uh, Nitrous account timed out during the break, you might need to go into the right directory again, which is the code slash example directory. So if you get your form right in your view templates, you will have something that looks pretty much like this. Uh, it has the label yes, uh, a number input field where you can uh, put your yes, and a button that says create yes. So I'm going to try this out by putting a random number. And you can see that the application tells us good guess, which is what we specified in the controller. But you can see that this game is also not very smart yet, because even if I put the correct guess, the game will still just tell me good guess. So it's it's not quite a game yet, because we didn't put the actual game logic in. Uh, the way I know it's the correct guess is when I created the game, I, I specified the number that I wanted to be the secret number. So you can just talk to your server and then create a new game. And Not, not in the actual code. Uh, when you go into your application, to catch up with the coaches roaming around. Uh, it's, we're going to use that to indicate whether the game is finished or not. So you can see the label is completed. So eventually when you guess the correct number, the game will be considered completed. Yeah.
Another question I just got is, what, what does the false mean here? So we're going to use this flag to indicate that the game is finished once we have the game logic in. So as soon as you have guessed the correct number, the game will be considered completed.
after they came redirect the controller, they, they are not sure what is the expected uh, outcome that they are supposed to see. Could you bring it through the process again? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, do it now. Right, so I'm going to show you again what the, the redirect part of the code actually does. So, I bring up my application again. And I'm gonna pick one of my games. I'm gonna pick the first game. I'm gonna go to the show page, which is the page where we put the form. So when I input a guest here and I click the create guest button, it is going to send this guest with this number to the create action in the guesses controller. And if you remember at the bottom of the create action, we told it to redirect us back to the show page and flash a notice to the user. So when I click this button, you're, you're not going to see in the browser the request going to the create action. It will just immediately redirect you back to the show page and it will flash the notice that you told it to do in the create action. If we did not specify this, this redirect at the bottom of the create action, uh, Rails would be, try to take some default action, which is usually to render the show page of the resource that we created. But because we don't have a show page for guesses, we can't really use that behavior. Before we continue, once you verify that your code is actually working, we're going to create a new milestone in Git so that our hard work is not lost in case we make any mistakes down the line. So to exit your server, you press Ctrl C. And once you're back in the terminal, you need to add all your files to the Git staging area. And once you've done that, you commit all your changes with a meaningful commit message. Once you've done this, you're somewhat safe because you won't lose any of the progress that you made this far. So we've gotten pretty far already, uh, but we're missing one critical piece of functionality for our game to be an actual game. And that is, it, it doesn't tell us whether the guess we made was correct, the correct guess or not. It will just tell us that it was a good guess. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and implement the actual game logic for the guess a number game. And we're going to be keep working in the guesses controller file. So unless uh, you kept it open, you need to uh, open that up again. So inside our create action, we're going to check if the guest number 
What's the actual number of the, the game that we were playing? And if it is, we're going to update the game and set the completed attribute to true. We're going to redirect back to the game path again, but we're going to change the message to tell the user that they won the game. If their guess however is not the secret number of the game, we're just going to redirect them back and prompt them to try again. So if you were to the previous workshops, you might recognize some of this uh, logic from the exercises done there. So on the first line in our create action now, we're actually storing the guess we just created into a local variable so that we com compare its number to the number of the game. Because if you only use one, it will be an assignment and it will always be true, which is not how we want our game to behave. Adding this if statement to our create action, we allow our code to know the difference between a correct guess and an incorrect guess, and we'll make it take the appropriate action for whichever case is true.
thing I am doing is that they are copy pasting the codes without actually knowing what they are doing. So in every every codes that you show, tell them what page that is. Like is this a what file is this or is this in the terminal? So it was. Like is, do they key this in the terminal or do they key this what file do they key this in? So be more explicit in like, where you are. Mm -hmm. So so do like a quick check on how many people got understood what they are doing here. Right, so can can we do a quick show of hands? Uh, which ones of you are uncertain about what's going on in this piece of code? So if you're not quite sure what's going on, please raise your hand and the assistant coaches will help you out. So essentially what we're doing here is we're comparing the number of the guess that the user just made from the form in our show page to the correct answer that we specified when we created the game. If the user made the correct guess, we're going to update the game itself to say that it is now completed. After that, we're going to redirect back to the game's show page. We're going to show the user a notice that they made the correct guess and they have now won the game. The other case is if the number is different from the correct answer, we will enter into the else statement and the only thing we will do is we will redirect back to the game's show page and we will flash another notice to the user to prompt them to try the game again. So we're going to try this code that we just wrote out in our browser. Hopefully you remember how to start the server by now. So it's rail server dash b 0, 0, 0, 0. now is that our application should be able to differentiate between a correct guess, which in this case would be 42, and any other guess. So I'm going to start by entering an incorrect guess and see what the response is in our application. So I'm going to guess the number 13, which is clearly wrong because the correct answer to this game is 42. Once I press the Create Guess button, the game will tell me that, no, this was not the correct guess, try again. So we know for sure that our game will recognize when the guess is incorrect. Now we're going to test out to see if it recognizes that the correct guess is actually correct. So I'm going to input 42 into the guess, which is the actual answer for this game. And hopefully the game will recognize this as a correct guess. And you can see here in our application, it recognizes this as a correct guess. So for one, it displays the, a different notice. It displays correct you win. And it also sets the completed flag to true here. 
which is what we did in the first line of our if statement. We told the game to update its completed attribute to true in the case of a correct guess. <laughs> and you will also be able to see this if you go back to the index page with the list of our games. You can see that this game is now completed. So after you added this if statement to your controller action, fire up your server and see if, that it's actually working. And if it's not working or you're getting errors, then just raise your hand and the instructors will come around and help you out. In the case that you don't have an actual game to submit your guess in, just use the new game link to create a new game in your database.
hopefully, at least a few of you have a fully functional guess the number game by now. Obviously, it's not, not quite the next Candy Crush, uh, at least not yet. But we're going to improve the game a little bit to, to make it a bit better. And the way we're going to do that is, firstly, we're going to check in the work that we've already done, so that we don't accidentally make a mistake and then we lose all the work we did with the game logic here. So to exit your rail server, you press Control C. Again, you add all your changes to the Git staging area, and you commit it using a meaningful commit message. game. So the first issue with our game in the current state is that the game is not that hard because the secret number we're supposed to guess is displayed in the game show page, uh, which kind of detracts a bit from the, the actual game. So we're going to make it so that the, the secret number is only shown once the game is completed. And at the same time we're only going to show the form that lets the user submit guesses. Uh, show only when the game is not completed. So the file we're going to be working with now is again the show template that is located in the views slash games directory. So this is the file you need to open in your IDE. It is not a command you run, it is the file that you need to open. So to this file, we need to add another if-else statement that makes it so that when the game is completed, we will not print... Uh, when the game is completed, we will print out the secret number, but if it's not completed, we will instead print out the form. So first, you need to locate the, fo the form that we added earlier. It is this code here. Starting at the line form 4. And to this code, we're going to add an if statement inside the template that checks whether the game is completed. If the game is completed, we shall display the secret number for the game. And this code here inside the if statement is already available somewhere in your template. So the parts you need to add to your template are firstly the if statement, secondly the else statement, and you need to finish it all off with an end. Once we have that, we put the code that is already there for displaying the number inside the if statement and we put our form inside the else statement. For the parts of the template that show if the game is completed or not, and the buttons, you can just leave them as they are. So depending on how your template file is laid out right now, you might need to reorganize the different paragraphs of it. Thank you. 
this works is that anything that is placed between the first if statement and the else statement will only be rendered if the game is completed. Whatever is placed after the else statement and before the final end statement will be rendered if the if statement is false. Again, you might have some template code before this code and also after it, and that, that is fine. In addition to this enhancement to our game show page, on the same page we're going to add a counter that keeps track of how many guesses have been made for this particular game. So the code required to do that is uh, not very long. You can place this anywhere you want inside your show template file. is very similar to the paragraphs that are already in the template and we're using the count method that is made available to us by Rails to get a count of the number of guesses for this particular game. Again you can place this code wherever you want within the template.
We're going to test out the changes we just made to the template. So, firstly, fire up your Rails servers and open up the page again in your browser. Again, the changes we just made were made to the game show page. So I'm going to pick the second game, the first game in my list here that is not yet completed. And I'm going to go to its show page. You can see now from this show page that the answer for this game is no longer displayed because the game is not yet completed. You can also see that we haven't made any guesses for this game just yet. So I'm going to go ahead and make an incorrect guess in order to see if this counter actually works. So the correct guess for this game is the number 13, so I'm going to go with another number. <laughs> I'm going to create this guess and just like before the page is going to tell us that nope this is not the right answer the game is still not completed and the number of guesses we have made for this game is now one so I'm gonna go with another incorrect guess We get the same result, and the counter of the number of guesses has now increased to two. <coughs> Finally, I'm going to give the correct answer for this game. Once I press create guess button, like before, the game tells us that the answer was correct and that we win. The game is now completed. It took us three guesses to win this game. Uh, now the game shows us the correct answer because we already won the game. And it no longer shows us the form that allows us to submit new guesses. So we're going to create a new game just to walk through it all again. Uh, I'm going to choose a number that is the correct answer for this game. I'm going to create the game. We're immediately taken to the show page. We can see that this game is not completed and no guesses have been made. But the form is there to make new guesses. I make an incorrect guess. It still works the same that it worked for the first game. Once we make the correct guess, the game is completed. We can no longer enter new guesses. And the answer is displayed inside the game. Our game is starting to shape up pretty nicely, but it's still not perfect. There are still some issues that uh, need to be ironed out. We're going to do that by adding some finishing touches to our game. One of the shortcomings of our game right now is that we can submit a guess without actually providing a number. And it doesn't really make much sense in a guess the number game that we can guess without guessing a number. So we're going to add some validations to make sure that the number is always provided. 
So as we mentioned earlier, validations are handled by Rails models, but we also have uh, a separate set of validations in our database that are called database constraints. And it's normally a very good idea to have the validations uh, in your models match your database constraints. So we're actually going to try to edit our migration files to add some database constraints. But because we already migrated our database using our existing migration files, we first need to roll back all the changes to our database. And to do this, we're going to use the rate db rollback command in our terminal. We're going to give it a step of two, which means that it will roll back the last two migrations. And in our case, we only have two migrations in our application. So this will reset our database to the state it was in before we did any changes to it. So you first use Control C to exit your Rails server, and then enter this command into your terminal. inside. This is the Ruby code that creates the games table inside our database. And because we want the number to always be there, uh, we're going to add a constraint to the number column, which is on this line that says t.integer number. To this line, we're going to append null colon false. And by doing this, we're telling our database that we will never ever allow this value to be null. Or in other words, we cannot create a game without also specifying a correct answer for that game. And while we're inside this file, we'll also apply the same treatment to the completed column, or the completed attribute of the game model. 
We don't want it to be able to be null. We want it to always be true or false. And when we create the game, we want it to default to false because we don't want the game to be completed as soon as we create it. somewhat mindful where you put the commas and the columns inside your code. While we're in this db migrate directory in our application, we're going to open up the other file, which is create guesses. And we're going to do the exact same thing to the number attributes that we did to the game by appending null colon false in the end. We're telling the database that we cannot submit a guess and store it in the database without also providing the number that we want to guess. Once you've made these additions to your migration files, first we don't forget to save the files. And after that we can try running our migrations again. And with a little luck this will work. If you end up with an error when you do this, uh, go back to your file and check that you got all the commas and the columns in the right places.
So we have made some changes to our database constraints by editing our migration files and rerunning our migrations. Now we're going to add the validations into our model files. So you can start by firing up the game model file in your editor by going to the app slash models directory and finding the game.rb file in there. So this is the file you need to edit to add a validation to the game model. And we're going to validate one single thing in our game model. We're going to validate the number attributes. We're going to ensure that it's there by specifying presence colon true. And we're going to validate that it's a number by doing numericality colon true. The way this syntax works in Rails is you start specifying a validation with the keyword validates. You pass the name of the attributes that you want to add your validations to. In our case, it's the number of attributes. Following this, you add any number of validations you want to add to these attributes. In our case, we added the presence validation, which checks if there is a value provided for the number in the first place. We also added the numericality validation that checks that the user didn't send in a string or something else, but an actual number. We're going to also add some validations to our guess model, which is located just next to the game model in the app slash models directory. And if you go in and fire up that file, these are the validations that we need to add. We're going to add two validations to the guess model. Firstly, we're going to validate that the game is always present. So we don't ever want to have a guest that doesn't belong to any of the games. So we're going to add a validation for the game attributes and validate that it's present. We're also going to use the exact same validation that we did for game in that we validate the number provided is present and there is a number. By doing this, we ensure that when a user guesses a number, if they did not provide a number at all, or if they provided something else like a string, we can present a proper error message to them, which we'll see soon.
validations uh, in our application to get you an idea of what it looks like inside the, the actual application. So you can go ahead and fire up your real servers again. If you're getting an error now trying to run your server, it is possible that you forgot to run your migrations again after you edited them, and Rails will give you a pending migrations error. <coughs> so we're going to test out our validations by trying to create a new game. And if you remember from the changes we just did, we stated that a new game must always have a number provided and the number itself cannot be a string or something else. So I'm going to try to create a new game and not provide a number for it. And you can see that the Rails scaffolding provides us with some facilities to display error messages to the user without us having to do anything but add a validation to our model. So in this, this case, I didn't provide any number. So Rails decided to show me an error message that says that two errors prevented me from saving this game. And the first is we added a validation to number that it has to be present. And it's telling us that here by saying that number can't be blank. We also added the validation that number must be a numerical value. But because no, no, nothing was provided at all, it also says that the value that we passed was not a number.
I have a lot of suggestion for like how to enhance this uh, is the word I think it's too much I think it's too much yeah as extracurricular activities so, so my question is would be, we be willing to accept like a, a very advanced version of this as the technical test submission mm, I'm trying to get a, like a, the pulse of the, the, of the to see they are they currently confused. If they are really currently confused, I'd rather do something simple and do it well, mm-hmm. rather than do something advanced. So, give me a minute, let me just get a few of the assistant coaches. Yeah. If not, then you know, just, just like, skip this, skip all this advancement and then just go through the entire app process. At least that they know something, but they can create something out of the important thing. Okay. Let's have- we need your GitHub. I can't, I can't use mine because I use one password. Yeah, it's already password. But what, do you need, what do you need from me? I need your GitHub account so I can show them how to push to GitHub. Oh.
that they're not following anymore. I've already lost what they, they are doing stuff, but I don't see the big picture. Mm -hmm. So let's let's scrape the advanced part and we can start from you know creating an entire app from scratch. Okay. Then try and tie in like where do you do your front end, where's the CSS file. They should know where the CSS file is, but just tell them the CSS file. Like movie concept and things for the for the events, blog and also travel app. You can just scaffold something in the day with concepts used today. Okay, so let's take the last remaining time to do that. Okay? Right. And I'll yeah. push it to GitHub and Roku. Yeah. Some of this. Yeah. Yeah. Push it. Can you create oh you just create a, a public repo so everyone can just like okay. <laughs> Thank you. You need any I won't be able to see what I'm doing there. Sure. We don't have any secrets here, right? I'll do the thing then. Yeah. Hello. So a lot of you have uh, some questions on like, how, so how do we take the stuff that we've learned in the three workshops and into to create an application for a technical task. So we're going to take the, the rest of the time for this workshop to put all the theory stuff that we have learned. And Ted is going to bring in the process of how do you create an application um, like how does it? How does all this theory stuff that I learned put together into an application and push it to GitHub and Euro? So yeah, so pay attention for this one. It's not still not big enough. Why don't you just use Sublime? Because I don't use Sublime. <laughs> it's gonna be very weird for me. Oops, I'm not, I don't want to print this. short amount of time. 
So I need your attention now to be able to see the steps you need to take to complete the technical task, which is the entry requirement for the bootcamp. So we're going to build a Rails app. So the first thing we need to do is to create a Rails project. And the way you do this in your terminal is by using the Rails new command. I'm going to name my project blog. And there are a bunch of options you can provide, but for the purpose of the technical task, you can just go with the defaults. So Rails is going to create all the scaffolding and all the files it needs. Uh, and it's also going to run bundle install, which usually takes a minute or two. reusing my nitrous container now but if you plan to use nitrous for your technical task then it's probably better if you uh, create a new rails project so you don't mix it up with your guess the number again the reason this bundle install takes so long is it's actually downloading all the uh, third-party libraries that Rails depends on. I should have some elevator music. You know everything we say is going to get recorded here. Still bundling. I wonder if everyone did this right now. <laughs> I think if everyone just did Rails new at the same time now, this might take a while. <laughs> Because we're all on the same Wi-Fi. Okay, so while we're doing this, I'm actually going to cut over to GitHub uh, to just create the new repository that we're going to use to store our code. So I'm logged into Elisha's GitHub account now. We're going to click the new repository button in the upper right hand corner. I'm going to name my repo just blog. I'm going to give it a short description. And I'm going to indicate that I want to make this a public repository. This is important partly because private repositories are paid and also for us to be able to review your code for the technical task, the repository needs to be public. I'm going to ignore the other options and I'm just going to say create repository.
seems like while we were setting up the repository in GitHub, we actually finished bundling our new blog application. So next to our example application, we now have a blog application. So I'm going to start by changing to the right directory. Now the first thing I need to do with a new application is to git init. This tells git that we want to create a new git repository to store our code. And you can also see from the terminal that as soon as we are done git init, it will create an additional piece of text in the prompt that tells us which branch we're in. We're going to add all the changes or all the changes that Rails have uh, added to our new project by doing git add. We're going to commit all the changes with the message of initial commit. I just realized this is not going to work because your Git user is not set up in the Nitrous. Always in your account. Yeah. And even my user is not set up in there. Even my user is not set up in here. Yeah. <laughs> so you should just set it up then, might as well. Huh? You should just set it up. You can set up my account here in your box. Yeah. I just need to remember how to do it. Um, isn't it Git remote yet? Yeah, yeah, that's just adding the remotes. But your, your user, like the actual oh, yes. certificate, yeah. And, so. and I don't even remember how to do that because it was so long since I did. <laughs> yeah. Then, so, okay, um, yes, do you just want to go on with? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to go on Yeah, sure. <laughs> Right, so we, we've actually uh, committed all the stuff that was uh, created by Rails. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some uh, scaffolding for a blog post in our application. So this is uh, what we walked through uh, earlier during the workshop. I'm going to use the Rails generate scaffold command. One is the title of the post and the other is the actual content. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this generator. Right, it looks like Rails created quite a bit of stuff for us. It's just a name. So post in this case is just the name I chose for the, the resource because our, our blog needs post thread. Right? So we're going to uh, commit this resource into version control. Uh, another useful command to use is uh, git status, which allows you to see all the unstaged changes that you have. So we're going to do the same thing that we did for the initial commits. We're going to add everything. We're 
We're going to commit it with a meaningful commit message. And in fact, before we do that, there is one step that I forgot to do, which is to migrate our database. And if I migrated my database after I committed the changes, then there would be one uncommitted change in that schema. All right? So we added a posts resource to our application. So we can just do a quick sanity check to see that there's actually something in our application. This is the default uh, root page in Rails. In this case, we didn't add a root path to our application, so it's going to look like this. But we should be able to visit our posts page. And it looks similar to our games index page for the yes uh, number app. And we can hopefully add new posts here. So we have something like an extremely primitive blog already with just one line of code from our terminal. I'm going to go ahead and exit the server by pressing Control C. You can use the command git log to see uh, a list of the commits we've done already. So I, we can, for the purpose of this exercise, we can say that we're pretty much done with our blog. Uh, the next thing we want to do is to get our blog onto GitHub. So GitHub actually provides you with some instructions here that you can use. So we need to add the remotes uh, for the repository that we set up in GitHub. And to do that, you can copy the URL that is given to you at the top. In our terminal, in our terminal, we use the command git remote add to add a new remote. You can name this remote anything you want. The default name is Origin, uh, but I, I like to name it GitHub to make it more explicit what it actually is. After that, you need to paste the URL that you just got uh, out of GitHub. The next step of getting your code into GitHub uh, would be to push the code to the remote that we just created. So I'm going to try that now and I'm pretty sure that it's going to fail, but let's see. So we're using the git push command. I give it the name of the remote that we just added and I give it the name of the branch that I want to push to GitHub. So it's asking me if I want to uh, add this new host, so I'm just going to go ahead and say yes. Alright, so as we expected, this didn't really work, because 
uh, we don't have access to the repository. And the reason is that uh, this Nitrous account doesn't have Elisha's Git user set up. So we're going to try to set that up now. Unfortunately, because it's like two years I did it the last time, uh, I'm going to have to Google, Google the, the actual steps. So it looks like, fortunately, Nitrous provides us with some neat interface here. It's telling me to go to the account settings page and select connect with GitHub. So I find the account settings by clicking my portrait in the upper right. Down here under GitHub, it's asking me to connect with GitHub to manage my keys. So it seems I was redirected to the landing page, which hopefully is an indication that it actually worked. So you can see we are now connected to GitHub uh, with Elijah's account. So we're going to go back into our application. So again, when you open up your application, you will not be in the, the actual project directory. So the first thing you need to do is to get in there. Let's check our git log. The stuff we committed is still there. So we're going to try to push it again to GitHub. Hopefully this time it will work. Again, we're going to use the git push command. We're going to tell it to push to GitHub, which is the name of the remote we added. And we're going to tell it to push the master branch. And unfortunately, it's still telling us permission denied. You go to the account settings under the project level, right? Mm -hmm. Under project level, there's two projects. In the project level, there's the settings. You get the key in the settings when you scroll down the same. Okay, so you need to add it on the project level. Okay, so I just got uh, some tips passed to me here that I actually in the dashboard also need to go under the project settings and manage my SSH keys. So you can see here my public key for this container and Nitro has provided us with a neat add to GitHub button so we don't even need to copy paste it into our GitHub account. Alright, so we're going to give it a third try and hopefully now we'll get another result. Right, so you can see that we no longer get permission denied. Uh, it is writing 102 objects to GitHub and it created the master branch on our GitHub account. 
So we're going to have a look inside, if I can find it. So if we go back to our repository, we can now see that all the code that we added in our Nitrous account has now been pushed to GitHub. We can see we created our projects 14 minutes ago and we added the post resource 9 minutes ago. So all the code we just wrote is now hosted on GitHub and this is what we want you to do for the technical tasks so that we can actually go in and have a look at your code. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy our application to Heroku to make it live on the internet. I'm signing into the Heroku dashboard from heroku.com. I'm going to use the new button in the upper right. I'm going to choose create new app. I need to provide an app name. This name needs to be unique to Heroku, so there, it's possible that a lot of names are already taken. So I'm going to name it techladies-blog. And that's the only thing required for you to set up the apps. I'm going to click the Create App button. So Heroku has now set up an application container for us. This allows us to push our code to Heroku and make it live on the internet. And the method we're going to use is we're going to push the code using Git to our Heroku remote. So let's see if in Nitrous if we actually have the Heroku tool belt installed already. So it seems like Nitrous conveniently provided us already with the Heroku tool belt. If you're not using Nitrous, you might need to install this manually. And to log in, you just use Heroku login. I signed into my Heroku account. The next thing we need to do is we need to add a new Git remote for our Heroku application. And the command for this is slightly different because you need to use the Heroku tool belt to set it up. But this command is also available from the Heroku dashboard, so you can just copy and paste it into your terminal. So it's telling us now it has added another Git remote called Heroku. And if you want to view a list of the remotes you already have, 
you can use the command git remote dash v. So in our case, it shows us the GitHub remote that we set up earlier. And now we also have a new remote called Heroku. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to push the code we just created to our Heroku application. And the way you do that is the same way that you push code to any other Git remote, including GitHub. So in this case, we do git push again, but instead of pushing to GitHub, we push to Heroku, and we specify that we want to push the master branch. And Heroku provides us with some status updating us with everything it is doing to set up our Ruby on Rails server. You can see it's currently doing bundle install. And it looks like our push was rejected. And the reason for that is that Heroku does not support uh, SQLite. So we need to pick another database gem. To do that, we need to go into our gem file. We need to change the line that says gem SQLite 3 to PG. We're going to use the version 0.18. I'm going to save this file and I'm going to bundle it again. Can you take this down time to explain like why must you use PG? Like the different data databases and PG is not So the reason we need to do this is there are several different databases to choose from. Uh, SQLite is the default database that Rails will uh, install for you when you create a new Rails app. But SQLite is not supported on Heroku. Uh, Heroku by default supports Postgres, which is shortened to PG in the gem name. While we're here, there's also another gem that is required by Heroku to run your application. We're going to add it in here. Uh, the gem is called Rails 12 Factor. So the gem name is rails underscore 12 factor. So we're once again going to bundle our application. Because we have done some changes now to our gem file, we need to commit those changes to version control. So once again, we're going to add the files to Git and we're going to commit them. I'm 
giving it that commit message, I'll change database gem to PG and add 12 factor. So once we've committed our changes, let's try to push to Heroku again. the deployment to Heroku was successful. So we're going to see if we can open our application, which should not work, we'll see. So we just use the open app button in the top right of the Heroku dashboard. And it's giving us an error page. And the reason for this is that we have not yet migrated our database on the Heroku server. So if you remember, the way we manage the database in Rails is through migration files. And we have not yet run those files on our Heroku server. So we're going to run those now. The way you run commands on Heroku is by using the Heroku tool belt and we're going to say Heroku run in this case. So we use the same rate db migrate command that we otherwise would, but prefix with Heroku run. You can see that it is giving us the outputs of running these migrations back in the terminal. And there is no rollback in there, which means that it should be successful. Once again, we're going to go to the Heroku dashboard, and in the top right, we're going to click Open App. And there's still something wrong in there. So we're going to go Thank you. 
it's a routing error, you don't have a root. But you show me the default Rails page, right? Or not in when running in production instance? No, because it doesn't have the index file. I think it doesn't display. Oh, it doesn't? It. I think so. Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but that's the error. Right, yeah. so Greg has a theory here that. Uh, has an error. Has a theory that on Heroku, we don't actually get the default uh, landing page of Rails. Uh, so let's have a look to see if our posts are actually in there. So it was actually working all along, only that because we didn't add the root uh, route like we did in our guest the number app. When Heroku tries to go to the roots URL, it doesn't find anything and it gives us an error. But you can now see they are very primitive app uh, that is hosted on techladies-blog.herokuapp.com slash posts. So anyone can now theoretically go and, and check this out. And anyone can add posts as well, which is not ideal for a blog application, but in order to keep the town back, time down, we didn't add any authentication to the application. So we now also have our first blog post on our Tech Ladies blog. And that is essentially all the steps you need to take to get an application from your terminal to live on the internet. Okay, how many of you are very lost? <laughs> Which part are you lost? <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> Do you mean I need a new table? Yeah. So the thing is that uh, there are different databases types that's available. So her question is, why do we need to change database and what is that PG SQL like thing about it? So the thing about Heroku that is it does not play well with any database except for Postgres. It's called P O S E G R E S. So that's why we need to get rid of the of the SQLite gem and it replace it with a PG gem. So you, with that, then you can just deploy it very easily. So every time if you want to make changes to the database gem, you have to go quick db migrate again, right? Bundle install. Bundle install. Yeah. When you change your gem file, you run bundle install and make sure that the computer is getting all the gems that you need to play your app. So who else was very confused? So can you see how the, the theory of the three workshops are actually coming in together? Because when you create a table, you talk about different data types, like this is a string, this is a text, this is an integer. And for the, on a second class, you learn about what is uh, front end, of which if you want to change the CSS of this of your app on uh, Nitrious. No, no, no. You you locate your CSS file where? Assets. Start this one? Uh, yeah, this one. Do we do it here or do no, no, in, in this. This? Okay, so you will do it here. So does it make a difference if it's post or scaffold as CSS? If you want to change the, the look of your uh, posts page, Specifically, you go into the posts.scss file. Uh, the scaffolds will apply to, to all your scaffolded pages. So if you only want to change the look of the post resource, you go to that post.scss. And if you, want to look, if you want to change the look of everything else, you go to the scaffold.scss. Is that correct? Yeah. So this is where you do the, the front-end workshop stuff we have done. You put it in either the resource or the entire scaffold itself. Here. Or here. Okay. Or people there. That side. Put there. Okay. Anyway. So in so that's the first two workshops. And in this workshop you learn about Rails. You learn about the MVC, what is the model, view and controller. 
and how you can easily use this to create an application by running the Rails generate scaffold. So if you remember the command, it was Rails. It's telling like, okay, I want to use Rails, and they are Rails. Please generate me a scaffold calling, and I would call this resource a certain name. So it could be post, it could be blog, it could be anything you want. So the thing that, you, how you pick a good name is pick by picking a name that makes sense when you try to read your code again. So don't have like some magical numbers, you can do that, but you'll be pretty confused on what it's about. So Rails generates scaffold post, and thereafter is your data type, uh, what do you want to call a column name, and what is this data type about. So once you run this, this command and then just do a rate db migrate, and then you have so an application which, which looks like this. So who, any other question? Who else is still very lost? Now is the, now the, now the time to ask, because this is the end of the three workshops before the technical test. So any questions with regards to like how do you, how should you think about the app that you want to do? So Amanda had a question on like when do I use, when do I put it in post and when do I use it in scaffold? So you use it in post or a resource specific if it's only for that resource. So that means your index file, your new file, your show file under the post as CSS. And if it's going to be across all the resources, like it could be post, it could be post and a comment, like block, then you put it in the scaffold CSS. But actually it's not a hard password, right? You just put it anywhere. Is it? Yeah, alright. So the files are only a way to organize your CSS. All CSS of all the files will actually be included in the actual CSS file that is included on every page. But it can be a good idea to organize your CSS. I think per controller is what they are saying here in the in the comments. Oh, yeah, per controller, which is your resource. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. So it's not it's not uh, it's not the end of the day. It's not you know it's not like a really big problem if you put it in the wrong CSS. As long as it is in one of the CSS files, make sure that your class names match, of course. Like Talk about any classes and stuff. Okay. We also have some questions. In terms of like yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the question is for the technical test, can we use Ruby instead of Rails? Yes we can. So it depends on if you want to do another guess the number similar type of game, then you might be more comfortable with Ruby directly. Uh, because what real stuff is, is a pre is a pre compiled list of formulas, uh, recipes that you can easily use. So it can be a bit too bloated for your use case. So it, so it really depends on what you want to do. If you want to do like a magic game, and you type a random thing, you get something else random, really might not be more suitable for the app. Any other questions? Any any other questions? Who who else is really lost? You can just stay back and you will have your Okay, that's your question. Uh, yeah, so we don't really dictate that you use Rails for the technical task, but it can be good to remember that uh, all the projects we will be doing in the bootcamp will be running on Rails. So we can sort of de delay the pain a little bit. And it's, it's normal to be very overwhelmed with Rails uh, because it's just the sheer scale of it. There are so many things and concepts in there. Uh, but really the only way to get, get over it is to get some mileage and build some applications with Rails uh, until you sort of wrap your head around it. Which can honestly take a bit of time. I think for me it took at least a couple of months of working full time with Rails before I felt comfortable with all parts of the application. Okay, so I guess I, I think it's also good to explore how you should think about your app. Um, for me, what works is I start thinking in tables. For example, in this post table, what, do I, what columns do I want? 
and what they are type are they before I start running. So if you look at the suggested ideas, go back to my slides. Kino. This. So let's take this for example. So, so let's think about tables. What? Okay, so this will be a table for articles. What's going to be in this table? It should be there should be a country name because it's a country name, so it will be a what a what type? It will be a shape, right? And then the next thing will be a trip description, which we're probably going to spell out the itinerary. So, what the other types are going to be? Uh, yeah, you can do a shape or you can do a text if it's, if it has a lot of things to add. If you mention some, I'll walk over here. <laughs> so, um, and then next is travel dates. So I guess is it is a time date time time date date or date time. Depending yeah. how specific you want to be. Okay. So for this data type, the travel dates, the data type would be time or daytime, depending on how trip you want to be. Okay, and and I guess the last trickier part is the photo. So um, you don't have to you don't have to uh, upload care about uploading photos for this for this app. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna cheat it for you. So for, for the photo, you can just upload the URL and and just have have, the, have it to show the image using the URL. So you don't have to care about uploading it as long as the image is already on the internet. There is a URL that locates that image, and you can just create a few that shows the that, that pulls the photo, uh, pulls the image using the image URL. So you use that by an image tag with a source attribute, SRC attribute. So in, so in that case, how, what is the data type of the photo should be, do you think? Um, yeah, it's supposed to be a JPEG, but since it's a URL, so it can be a string. So photo, photo is a string data type. Okay? So now you know that for this app, there is one resource called articles. And in the article, there is a name, description, travel dates, and a photo. Of which photo is a string because of uh, what I'm saying. So you can see to show the articles of a country, this is the show page. So you, you, does it click now that this is the show page? And then when there should be a page showing all the articles, this is the index page of the of the Rails app. Okay. Some ideas, some ideas of what we have. Okay, Sh do you, should we do another example? Okay. Uh, this is easy, let's do the third one. Okay, now this is the event, event right uh, app. So it, let's do this again. Okay, so how, how would you think it in terms of tables? So in this table, the one of the tables I want is called events. And in the events table, what column should we have? <laughs> so in the title, what kind of data type should it be? This data type should be a string. And then next we're going to have description of with this description, assuming that it's a long write-up. So what data type should it be? This data type should be a text. So picture, uh, what data type should it be? Yeah. So the picture should be a shape, and the date is of course a date and date time. So user can add events. So that is your events new page, because it's a form where you can add all the stuff that you need. And of course there should also be a show page with all the data that you have key in. And then the next part of the app is have an events listing page, and this will be your index page. Okay, get the hang of it. Get the hang of it. Okay, let's just do the, the second one anyway. Okay, maybe I should stand here. Um. Okay, this 
you sh all of you should be expert for this one because that's sort of like what we went through earlier. So again, we will have a blog post. So what should what data what data what columns should it should there be in the post table? Hi. Yes, the title is, is this one. And what data type should the title be? Like, yeah, but okay, so what else? What other than title, which is a string, what else should be in the box? Yes. So in the blog post there should also be a content columns and that that data type is a text. So here, that means that there will be a new page and also a show page that shows you what you have typed, what, what blog article you have created. And then there's also have a home page, which essentially is your index page. Uh, this one is too difficult to illustrate with that, doesn't matter. Okay, so is there, do you feel less lost now? Oh, this is better. Okay, okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Anyone have any other questions? Okay, in that case then this will be this will wrap up the entire free bootcamp workshop series. I hope you had a lot of fun learning and being confused, which is part and parcel of learning new things, you know, everything is overwhelming. This doesn't this is increased like English but not English and what I'm doing. So it's perfectly calm. Perfectly normal, and that's why we also have a community that helps you. Just post on the group, and um, if no one replies, I will grab someone to reply for you. Okay, so um, I'll be sending out a, a survey just to just to you know, really understand how we can do workshops better. You should receive it in about an hour's time. So we have this space until we get kicked up, which I don't know what time really, but it's probably late. So just feel free to stay back if you want to have all of the coaches help to help you think through how you want to create the idea that you want to do. Okay? Uh, if nothing else, then thank you so much for coming. You, all of you deserve a round of applause for yourself. Thank you so much. Good job, good job, ladies. Good job, ladies. So, yeah, have fun. Have a great weekend. Did I rescue you? Did I rescue you? Great rescue. Hey, you're the first I could stop talking. Yeah. Let's cook. Let's cook. Cook the stuff. Let's cook the stuff. Oh yeah. I'm very hungry. Huh? I'm not joining. Oh, yeah.